Okay, uh, hi everybody. I'm Luca Cerezoli and I'm talking about how Linux can run on the Zinc MP processor by Xilinx, especially in the ways that it differs from other system on chips. I work as an embedded Linux engineer at IAM Sportline, designing the next generation data loggers, dashboards, and action cameras for racing. I also love open source, of course, and uh, I contribute to some projects, including uh, BuildRoot. Um, okay, so uh, I will first give you a brief introduction about the, the chip itself, and then proceed to which development tools are available, uh, how Linux can use your FPGA design and uh, how to boot this thing. Um, and then there are a few shorter sections about using the GPU and the video codec unit. Okay, so uh, this, uh, basically the Zinc MP is a so-called SOC plus FPGA. So it is a system on chip, pretty much like many others, but it also had a piece of FP FPGA which is directly connected to the processor uh, on chip which makes it very efficient with respect to other architectures where the FPGA is connected externally uh, or the CPU is synthesized on, on the FPGA itself. Uh, if you are new to the topic, there is a good introduction by Marek Vajut. Uh, this talk is uh, an overview of, of the topic, which is quite good. Okay, uh, basically uh, the two main vendors for this kind of thing is, uh, are Xilinx and Altera, which is now Intel. And I'll be talking about the current second generation uh, by Xilinx, which is the Zinc Ultra Scale Plus MP SOC, but people call it Zinc MP because it's shorter. Uh, there is a previous family generation of uh, SOCs, which is the Zinc 7000, which is now pretty much well established. Uh, Intel has a pretty similar uh, set of two generation of processors, but I don't know much about them. Okay, this is uh, the block diagram of the system on chip. As you can see, it has, well, in its uh, most complete versions, it has a quad-core uh, ARM 64-bit processor, A53, uh, two real-time cores. Uh, it also has the usual long list of peripherals for system on chips. Uh, most, of the, most of them are connected to a low-power interconnect. Uh, a few of the faster peripherals are on the full power interconnects. Uh, okay, then there is also a GPU in some versions. Uh, there is, of course, a DDRAM controller. There are two specialized units, the CSU and the PNU, that are involved in booting, so I will talk about them later. Uh, it also has a video codec unit, which is a video encoder and decoder in hardware, uh, and some other very fast peripherals that I'm not talking about. And of, then there is, of course, the FPGA, which makes this design quite um, peculiar. Okay, so uh, to develop on this kind of uh, on, on processor, of course, first of all, you need some documentation. There is a lot of uh, good documentation, generally quite good by Xilinx. Uh, it's accessible on that pretty long URL on their website. Uh, there you find like a few dozen documents uh, of general interest uh, about, about the platform and then there is much more. Okay, then uh, you, starting bottom up, you design your FPGA. Uh, this is not the subject of this talk, but anyway, just briefly, the uh, tool that Xilinx provides for, for this is the Vivado design suit, which includes Vivado itself, which is the thing you use to design FPGA uh, down to the bitstream, which gets downloaded into FPGA. And then there is the XSDK, Xilinx SDK, which is an Eclipse IDE to, uh, to build um, firmware, uh, bare metal software for the Xilinx processors. Uh, all of this runs quite okay in Linux, and there is also a zero cost version. It's all license based, so it's not really completely free, but uh, the zero cost version has most of the features, uh, but not the most advanced ones. Uh, okay, so it's quite uh, useful, it does a lot of things, however it is closed source, it is a very huge software to install, uh, you have to have a pretty powerful computer to use it. It also has some bugs and annoyances that 
uh, people complain about. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, it's closed source, so you can do much about that. But uh, it's a generally a good product, but you might wonder whether you can use some open source alternative. Uh, you're not that lucky because uh, today it is not possible to use a fully open source tool chain for this uh, kind of FPGA. Um, although there is a reverse engineering effort in progress, it's called the CBFlow project, and it's in quite an early stage for the Zinc 7000 platform. So for Zinc MP, it's probably very soon now to expect something. But it's good that this thing exists. Uh, OK. Here is an interesting link on other reasons why you might want an open source tool chain. OK, when you have your FPGA uh, working, you need uh, to build the software on top of it. And of course, the two main pillars of a BSP to support the processor are Linux and U-Boot. And okay, uh, about U-Boot, uh, Xilinx is quite uh, active in working on mainline U-Boot to support the, uh, their own processors, which is very good. Um, I think uh, it, well, it, it's supposed to be ready to boot Zinc MP processors uh, in uh, U-Boot mainline. Uh, although I haven't tested that because it doesn't support the board I have. Uh, but uh, there is also some additional development that you can find in the Xilinx uh, GitHub repo. They have their own U-Boot fork with things that are not yet in mainline, so you may want to look at that if you need something, uh, a board or a feature that is not yet in the mainline. Okay, uh, the other big piece is, of course, the Linux kernel, and the situation is quite similar, so Xilinx is contributing to that as well, uh, although uh, I think they are a lot more behind, so uh, I think it's quite incomplete so far. Uh, so you might probably want to uh, have a look at the Xilinx uh, fork on GitHub. Uh, it is... Uh, the, the current... Uh, uh, branch from Xilinx has started like one year ago, so it's diverging a lot from mainline. But they, from time to time, they start a new branch, somewhat like once per year, probably not official. So there might be a new branch starting, uh, being published soon uh, from a recent kernel. Uh, the one that's now in use is uh, a branch from kernel 4.9. Okay, and. On the uh, Xilinx uh, branches, you can find both uh, development for the hard silicon features that are specific to Zinc MP and to the IP blocks that you can put in FPGA and that are uh, new in, uh, in the Zinc MP uh, that were, were not existing before, especially uh, related to video processing. Okay, and finally, you need to build uh, the whole system. Um, and in this respect, there are, uh, you have to make a choice about the workflow that you want to use because there are uh, at least two main uh, possibilities. Um, I've called them the Xilinx workflow and the community workflow. The first is the one that Xilinx supports and uh, documents in their own reference designs. And uh, the second is uh, developed by the community uh, with some, some support by Xilinx also. Uh, and it is closer to how other open source uh, development works in other uh, vendor system on chips. Uh, of course, you can somewhat mix and change on this, but these are the two that are um, in most common use as far as I know. Right, the, the Xilinx workflow involves, of course, using uh, Vivado and XSDK uh, for the FPGA and the uh, you know, bootloaders and the, the, the low, low level stuff. And then they use a Peta Linux as a build system, which is a Xilinx specific uh, build system. It used to be a build system on its own, uh, different from other things. Uh, nowadays, it uses Yocto internally, so it got a bit more standard. Although, if you use Peta Linux directly, you don't see Yocto working, but it's there somewhere in some of its subdirectories. So you can have a look at how it builds things and which recipes it used. Um, it uses actually those three layers mainly. Uh, so in case you want to have a look, they are all on GitHub anyway. Um, and the other workflow, the community workflow, uh, also involves using Vivado because uh, it's currently the only tool that you can use to design the FPGA, and also a little bit of XSDK. I will talk about that later. Uh, 
Uh, and then there is one uh, layer, the meta Xilinx BSP layer, uh, which is um, developed uh, quite in, uh, in line with the standards for, uh, for a, a build root, uh, a Yocto project, and as well as a general um, uh, BSP for any uh, system on chip. All right, and um, but this does not support yet all of the features, but uh, it's still, it's already quite complete now. Okay, uh, a couple other useful resources. There is the Meta Xilinx mailing list, which is uh, mostly to discuss the uh, the Xilinx related layers, but uh, it is also a place for general discussion about the uh, the uh, usage of Linux on this SOC. Uh, on, on Xilinx hardware in general, uh, so it's useful uh, for, for many users. Uh, it's low traffic, so we, you can follow it easily. And also there is this layer, Metatopic, which is just support boards made by a manufacturer called Topic Embedded, uh, but it has some useful code that uh, I used that, that, that is not found on other layers. Okay, uh, there is no currently support for the ZinkMP in build root, the, but it's work in progress. There is a first patch set on the mailing list that will add basic support from one board, and it will evolve to uh, probably support it in the next few weeks or months. Okay, uh, so um, let's see now uh, when you design your FPGA, how you can run it on Linux. Uh, okay, uh, the, the very interesting thing that I found very, very cool about this kind of, uh, of chip is that you can basically design your own system on chip. That's because uh, the FPGA is connected to the CPU via AXI4 buses. AXI4 is part of the AMBA uh, specification by ARM, so it's the same kind of buses that is used inside the system on chip to connect the processor to the peripherals. And so it follows the same standard. You can access the registers in an IP block in FPGA, just like you access the registers on an IP block uh, in silicon. And so it actually becomes like a, a system on chip that you design in part. Okay, uh, the steps uh, when using Vivado are mainly three, uh, IP integration, address editor, and constraints. The first step, IP integration, uh, it takes place in this window, the block design editor. You can't read that, that's okay. It's Blocks connected by lines is basically uh, oversimplifying, but that's an electronic circuit. Um, each of these blocks uh, gets synthesized into FPGA, uh, and uh, it, with some exceptions, the block one here with Zinc Ultra Scale written on top of it uh, does actually represent uh, everything that is on the chip outside the FPGA. So it's there just to re because th this view is FPGA centric. So that is there because you can double click on it and customize it. So you can customize how you want the hard silicon part to work. You can configure the PLLs, the, uh, the power domains, the uh, various peripherals, buses, and so on. Um, and this results in a configuration file that gets saved, which uh, be, uh, actually sets a long list of registers into the, the, the various peripherals. Uh, if you double click on other blocks, such as, for example, a GPIO block, you can customize that one as well. In this case, it will change what will be synthesized in the FPGA. For example, you can say for this, FB, for this GPIO block, you only want three, uh, three pins, not uh, 32, because you need only three, so you optimize usage of your FPGA. You want uh, only inputs, and you cannot set output because you don't care, and you want to have an interrupt. Or is it? Oh, here. You want an interrupt line. Um, so in, in this case, you will have a customized hardware. Uh, and when you synthesize that in FPGA, you need to put it on Linux. So there is a, a wiki page by Xilinx which lists all of the devices uh, that can be present either in silicon or in FPGA and uh, how to use them. So it points to uh, which is the Linux driver, and there's some documentation of it. And in the Linux kernel, uh, the, the device tree bindings are documented. So you can write your own device tree uh, uh, snippet to support this block. And it's nothing but a GPIO controller with its own compatible string that you get from the documentation. But you also have to say, uh, 
sometimes mm, several parameters to tell to Linux how the hardware has been synthesized. So you have to tell it, it has three pins, it, they are all inputs, it has interrupts, or they are all outputs, and so on. Uh, otherwise, the operating system will try to access registers that are not implemented, or generally to use features that are not there, and this will result in crashes. So it's very important that you keep in sync your FPGA bitstream with your device tree. Uh, it's very easy to like update one and not the other and then everything crashes, so you have to pay a lot of attention to this. Okay, so uh, interrupts are managed this way. Uh, the uh, the non-FPGA part can have uh, up to two interrupt uh, ports, each of eight bit, and you can connect. This line here comes from the GPIO block you've seen before, and so it will end up in one of these things here, uh, and this entering the hard silicon part, and this is connected to the GIC, so the main interact controller in the ARM core. And so uh, this is how you do it in Vivado, and you configure it in Linux in a very standard way, so you have interrupt parent is the GIC, unless it is, it, you have an additional interrupt controller outside, of course, and you have interrupts, we take three parameters, so it's uh, the, the type of interrupt, but the most important is this one, which is the interrupt number. To know which is the interrupt number, you have to uh, add your offset here to the base, address, base number, which is somewhat hard to find. You have to look here and there to find it. And so, but luckily there is a file that has the fines for them. So I think this is 96 or so. Uh, unfortunately, that the fine file, that the TS, DTSH file that defines this one is not in the kernel sources. I found it on this other repository here. So I copied it immediately in my kernel and uh, it's very useful. Okay, next step in Vivado is the address editor. Whenever you add a block that is accessible uh, via an interconnect, it will uh, add a, a mapping in the address map for that block. So this is all done automatically. And for the GPIO block, it will be accessible at address A00, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is uh, something that you can change if you want. Uh, and then this is the number that you have to put in device tree. So you, in your reg keyword, you have to put this address here and the width, which is in most cases 64 bits. And that's it, so that, that gets very standard. Uh, again, you have to keep them in sync. The, your bit stream with your uh, device stream must be in sync or everything can happen. The third step is define the constraints for each of the nets, basically the lines in the, your FPGA design that go outside the chip. You have to define to which pin they map, the I.O. standard, the, whether they have a pull up or pull down, the similar things. Uh, but this is not, uh, this doesn't affect the Linux part because it is not uh, related to the software but rather to the outside of the chip. So no visible impact here on the kernel. Okay, uh, that's all for the uh, Linux configuration. It's pretty standard if you pay attention to keeping things in sync. And uh, the next big step is uh, you have to boot it. Uh, well, actually, it's the previous step, but uh, I put it in this place. Uh, okay, uh, back at the good old, good old times with simpler system chips, you just had to load an SPL from, from storage to internal RAM that initialized RAM and loaded the big bootloader, which loaded the kernel. In ARM64, it's a lot more complex, of course. Uh, and uh, one of the items that are involved is the uh, platform management unit, the PMU thing, which is here, which is a processor that uh, um, is responsible to do all power gating and clock gating. So it is very, very important for uh, the system to run. You cannot boot without its intervention because it has to enable the devices you need. Uh, this design is somewhat similar to many other ARM64 boards. Um, it's rather complex, uh, but so you have to, to handle this. It's mandatory. And, uh, okay, another uh, unit involved is the CSUD uh, Configuration and security unit, I think. 
And so, um, first about the PMU. Uh, the PMU uh, is actually a micro blaze processor, so it's a, a small microcontroller basically, uh, which uh, mm, which uh, can can execute executes a firmware that you can reprogram. But in the practice, you must reprogram it if you want to boot, because um, both U-Boot and Linux require uh, a PMU, PMU firmware that is more recent than the one in uh, some silicons, uh, and so you have to reprogram that. Luckily, the uh, source code has been made public by Xilinx. We just, it's actually a permissive license, but with the restriction to execute only on Xilinx hardware. But anyway, the sources are there. You can work on them. And there is a recipe in the Meta Xilinx BSP uh, master branch uh, to build it. Uh, in order to build it, it first builds an entire microblaze uh, tool chain with new lib. Um, so it will end up in a firmware build for you. Okay, and uh, the <laughs> PMU firmware uh, does not run on its own. It also needs a configuration object. Uh, it basically tells uh, which uh, master uh, owns which slave, where masters are more or less the CPUs and the slaves are the peripherals. So, so that's just to avoid that both uh, the Cortex A53 and the R5 or another processor synthesizing FPGA request the same peripheral and this wouldn't work, of course. Uh, this uh, configuration depends on how you configure things in Vivado, in the big window where you configure the, uh, the hard silicon block. So there's a configuration file generated for that. Another big component you need for booting is ARM trusted firmware. Uh, you need it on, I think, every ARM64 uh, architecture. And uh, it is, what it does is it answers to uh, U boot or the kernel or whatever is in the less privileged uh, execution level. Uh, it replies to SMC calls, which SMC is a ARM standard. And these calls allow, for example, to enable devices and so on. Uh, but actually, ARM trusted firmware does not do the job really, but forward this request to the PMU using exiling specific API. So you need both of them. And when, uh, for example, you boot or the kernel tries to enable a device, it will ask ATF, which in turn asks to PMU, and then the device gets enabled. Okay, uh, there are two workflows, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and there are two uh, boot flows also. So if you're using the Xilinx workflow, you, uh, you are um, guided to use this boot flow where uh, there are mainly three actors, the PMU, uh, the, the CSU, and, the, and one of the processors, for example, the A53, but it could be the R5 as well. Um, okay, uh, at power up, the PMU wakes up, and all it does is wake up the CSU. The CSU loads the first stage bootloader, it's an exciting specific bootloader, into uh, uh, memory to be executed by uh, the A53 processor, for example. And it also loads the PMU firmware inside the PMU. So it is where the PMU firmware gets uh, updated during boot. All right. Uh, then the FSBL uh, loads from the boot medium uh, the configuration object and send it to the PMU. And then ATF and U-boot. So this way, uh, U-boot can really start and, and go through ATF and PMU to do all of its stuff. So it's, it's quite complex. Um, okay, and in order to build the pieces, uh, you have to go through this, uh, this thing. Uh, you start from Vivado uh, with your HDL design, your FPGA design, and it produces an HDF file, which means hardware description file, which in turn uh, you use to open the Xilinx SDK and based on how you configure the hardware, it has wizards to produce a PMU firmware, a first stage bootloader, each with its own BSP. It's all uh, done with, via wizard, so it's very easy. Um, and in the end, they will produce the two binaries for the PMU firmware and the FSBL. Also, uh, the FSBL BSP is the place where this file PM configuration object.c will be created. It is the configuration object to be fed to 
uh, the PMU. And so, as you can see, it's in the FSBL. So it's a FSBL that owns this configuration. Uh, all right. Then Peta Linux, actually via internal EOP rules, will build ARM trusted firmware and U-boot. And all of this, along with the bitstream for the FPGA, is uh, fed to the bootgen tool, which will produce the boot.bin file. Boot.bin is the big file with all of the things that happen in boot before uh, the Linux kernel, basically. And it, it is put on your boot media, for example, the SD card, and then uh, the hardware, the, the, the boot the ROM loader, which is executed by C, the CSU, will load from the boot bin only uh, um, um, PMU firmware and FSBL. And then FSBL will open the file again and uh, extract all of, all of the rest to put them in, uh, uh, in memory or in FPGA. So that's the build flow with Xilinx workflow. Um, this has some advantages. It's supported, of course. The Xilinx tools make it easy with wizards and clicks. And uh, also the FB FSBL code is uh, very simple. It's, it's simple to understand how it works. Uh, so if you want to understand what's going on. But uh, on the other hand, it's not optimized. So it's super slow. For example, to load a relatively small FPGA it takes uh, like three seconds, uh, which could be optimized a lot. Uh, also, the Xilinx tools are a pretty heavy requirement, especially if you have um, Continuous integration, uh, you have to install them, and then they are hard to automate. So uh, it, uh, it is um, a little bit cumbersome to use in some cases. And uh, also the proprietary boot gen tool is needed to generate the boot bin with all of this stuff. Um, and finally, it, this flow is completely different from other uh, build flows that you probably used on other uh, vendor socks. So uh, let's see what's the alternative that the community has come up with. Um, uh, this one is, uh, the, the core of this alternative is that uh, we have to replace the first stage bootloader with something else because um, the, the first stage bootloaders need a boot being produced with the selling specific tools. And uh, so we, we want to replace FSBL for performance and for this reason. Uh, the, net, the obvious uh, replacement is Ubuntu SPL, uh, which does a very similar thing. Um, but uh, there are a few obstacles to this. First is that um, Ubuntu SPL cannot lo load the FPGA like, uh, like the FSBL does. This is not an issue, however, because Ubuntu can load it. And it's also a lot faster than the FSBL. It's about 10 times faster because it's optimized. Uh, the second issue is that uh, the uh, U-boot FSBL uh, well, loads U-boot, uh, not arm trusted firmware. So uh, various architecture have various ways to, to achieve that. And in this case, there's a trick to achieve that. And finally, um, U-boot SPL uh, cannot load the PMU firmware configuration object. So we'll get to the second and third point. Uh, now, uh, okay, to load arm trusted firmware, the, the thing is, you would need ATF, but uh, so, so SPL must, must load both for you would to be able to run. And what happens is there is a, a trick to do this, which is uh, in all the uh, Zinc MP dev configs, uh, Falcon mode is enabled in uh, uh, SPL Falcon mode. It, this is a mode which is meant to uh, op achieve a higher boot speed uh, than with regular U boot. So uh, what it does is SPL loads directly the kernel and the device tree in RAM and jumps to the kernel completely bypassing new boot to speed up the boot. But in this case, uh, it is configured in such a way that the DTB image is called uboot.bin and the kernel image is called arm trusted firmware uboot.ub. So it thinks it's loading kernel plus DTB, but in the practice it is loading uboot and ATF. So uh, this approach works, uh, oh sorry, this approach works, but uh, you lose the possibility to use Falcon mode to really speed up the boot because you've already hijacked it for something else. And okay, it's a bit of a hack, but at least it solved for us one of the problems. The other big problem is the configuration object. Configuration object uh, must be loaded into uh, the PMU firmware for it to work. 
but uh, there is no code in SPL to do it. First, because nobody wrote it. Second, because of uh, license uh, conflicts. And so, what happens uh, is there is workaround. The, it is the best workaround that I know of at the moment, which is you take the PMU configuration object as produced by XSDK and uh, um, put link it directly into the PMU, the PMU firmware and then modify the PMU firmware to load it directly at startup. So it's hard coded inside the PMU firmware. Uh, it's very simple. It comes from the metatopic layer that I mentioned before. It's not in mainline, uh, not at the moment at least. I mean, not in the mainline uh, meta signing VFP layer. Uh, it might be in the future. Uh, okay, uh, since understanding how all of this thing was a bit complex and took a lot of time, I wrote a very trivial script that does the very minimum needed. It's in this repository. Uh, it does only three things. Take cross tool and G to build a micro tool chain, uh, patch the PMU firmware uh, sources and build it. Uh, so you, it's easy to understand how the PMU firmware gets built and uh, it allows to use it without having to set up all of the uh, Yocto machinery and rules to do it. So this approach works, which is good. Uh, on the other hand, it forces you to rebuild the PMU firmware every time you change uh, your uh, configuration in the, in the core uh, things. But anyway, you would have to rebuild the FSBL with the Xilinx workflow, so it's not very much different. Okay, so the boot sequence with the community workflow becomes this one. It is very similar to the other one, but the differences are um, SPL is loaded instead of the FSBL, uh, so it's just another piece of code doing similar things. And the configuration object is not loaded by the SPL, it's hard coded directly in the PMU firmware. The rest is all identical. Okay, um, but that's not all. Uh, we also need something else uh, because, well, um, what you do in the um, in, in Bivado, you configure lots of devices and uh, in all of this hard silicon part, and that uh, results not only in the PMU firmware um, configuration object, but also in a file that is called PSU init GPL. Uh, well, two files actually. There is .ca.h. And uh, these, um, th these need to be uh, applied. It's basically a long list of uh, register settings. So it sets a bunch of registers to set pin muxes, PLL speeds, and the SD run controller, and so on. Uh, this file uh, e can be obtained this way. So w when you um, you done your design with Vivado, you can just do file export export hardware. It will create the HDF file which is actually a zip file, you extract it and you get these two files. You put them in the U-boot sources in this directory. You also have to make sure that it, the, those are built and not the other ones that U-boot has for some boards. Uh, and so that's it. When you've done with that, you have a U-boot that at boot will set all of those registers and they will, uh, they will work. So it, the annoying part of it is, is that you have to launch the whole XSDK manually to produce a file just to obtain a single .c file. Uh, but the rest of the, uh, of the build process is, uh, well, maybe a little simpler. Um, so it starts in the same way with Vivado producing the HDF file. And the, from that you can launch the XSDK, uh, which uh, you only use to launch the wizard, produce the FSBL, DSP and take the PM configuration object .c file. Oh, .c is missing. Okay, uh, from there and that's it. Then you can throw away everything produced by XSDK, and the build process is entirely done by Yocto in this case, and it will be the quite standard arm, arm trusted firmware uh, and U boot. Actually, it will build the PMU firmware uh, along with its uh, micro tool chain which links the PMU configuration object. And finally, uh, the U-boot rules can produce uh, the, of course, the U-boot proper, the SPL, and then they can produce a minimal boot.bin that only contains the SPL, and which is the, 
the, the, the Ubuntu SPL and the PMU firmware itself. It doesn't contain all of the other pieces and it doesn't do fancy features uh, just like encryption and similar. So it's very minimal to this use case. Um, in the end, you have just to put on your boot medium uh, all of those files because the other files are accessed by SPL. Um, and that's it. So in this way, you can have a complete build uh, which boots and works. Uh, it is one of the two main approaches. Uh, So that's it for booting. Uh, the next uh, chapter is uh, about the GPU. This uh, system on chip has a GPU, which is uh, very interesting, makes it very, very interesting. But the CPU is an Armali 400, which is very sad because it's it has very bad support. I think it's luckily the worst one in, in, in terms of software support. Uh, that's because it requires a binary blob which uh, makes things always a little bit complex and, and annoying. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, that, that's the only option. Uh, although there are two open source alternatives. One is the, uh, the Lima driver, the reverse engineering uh, project that uh, has done a lot of the reverse engineering work, but has never reached uh, real usability for uh, complete projects and is now abandoned, I think. Uh, the other is the Mesa Lima project. It is uh, quite a new project, started I think last year, and it's advancing uh, not super fast but steadily. And so it may be that at some point we have an open source driver for this uh, for this GPU. Uh, although at the moment I think it's ready just for do some simple rendering, not yet ready for for uh, complex applications. So let's see how you do things in the only possible way. Um, so you have to use two components. There's a kernel driver, which is GPL, but it's not in mainline. Uh, one of the issues with this driver is it does not match. Actually, all of the real work is in the user space library. Uh, all the interesting stuff is done in the user space library, which is the, the binary blob that you have to use and which implements the OpenGL API, ES APIs. So uh, every other application is based on top of that. Um, also, this library is uh, SOC specific, so you cannot reuse the library from other uh, processors. Um, so you have to use the one from Xilinx. Uh, to build this compo the two components, well, the, uh, the kernel module is fairly simple. There is a Yocto recipe on the Meta Xilinx BSP, which just downloads the source for ARM and applies 10 patches, and then it's, it builds just fine. I haven't looked in, into detail into it because it worked uh, at the first attempt. Um, the other part is the user space library, which is more complex. First of all, you have to find it. Uh, it's not in the uh, main uh, master branch. Uh, for uh, MetaXilinx BSP. It is only in the Xilinx uh, fork, which is on GitHub. So if you want to stay on the master branch uh, working on that, uh, you can just take the recipe from the, uh, the, the most recent is the rel v2017.4 layer. You take the recipe from there, copy it in your own layer, and uh, that's okay. It should work without any modifications. Now that you have your recipe, you run it and it fails because it cannot download the sources. In fact, the URL to download the sources is uh, from this, uh, this domain which is uh, not accessible. It appears to be an internal repository uh, for signing, so you cannot download from that. So you go into the uh, documentation and there is a readme file in the, uh, uh, along with the, with the recipe and uh, it tells you have to register on the Xilinx website, download the tarball, and uh, open the tarball. There is some instructions and a second tarball, and then you have to extract the second tarball, and which contains the third tarball. And the, yeah, no, that's, that's all. There are only three. <laughs> we are almost finished. Uh, then in the third tarball, when you extract it, extract it, it looked like a, a bare git repo. Uh, and in fact it is. It is basically the thing that 
a bit baked downloads in the download directory. The, it probably has been taken as is, put in a tarball, in a few tarballs, and then you have to put it in some random directory that you want and point source mirror URL uh, in your local conf to this path so that Yocto will find it as if it had downloaded it and then things will work. Uh, so a slight simplification on this, well, I, I basically wrote a, a stupid script to do all of these steps because uh, you have to redo it whenever you want to upgrade the library or uh, whenever you want to bootstrap a new development machine. But uh, I also um, chose to down extract it in the main download dir for Bitbake, so I, at least I can skip the last step and leave source mirror URL for what it's meant for. When you're done with that, um, you can use it in two ways because there are actually two different libraries. One is to use with fpdev, with good old frame buffer, and the other with x11. Um, <coughs> okay, the frame buffer version uh, actually uh, works for normal needs of many embedded systems like running a Qt or QML application uh, on a single screen, it works. But forget multi-screen, it doesn't work. Uh, apparently there is slash dev slash fb0 hardcoded in the library, so you cannot use more than one screen. Um, so we tried X11, the X11 version, but uh, we couldn't all make multi-screen work with that one as well. Um, not sure why exactly, but uh, QML with the software renderer works fine with multi-screen, while uh, the, uh, the accelerated one does not work. So uh, I don't know exactly about that, but uh, that's it. At least waiting for an open source alternative. And that's all for the, uh, for the GPU. And uh, let's go to the video codec unit. Um, this is, well, this is a little better in terms of support, luckily. Um, so what happens here is there is this video codec unit which is an H.264 and H.265 uh, in hardware. Uh, it's able to do like 4K at 60 FPS, so it's quite powerful. Uh, the interesting thing, it is not connected to an interconnect. It is uh, floating in the middle of the FPGA, so you have to wire it inside the FPGA to use it, uh, which I think it makes it a little bit more flexible. Uh, well, anyway, this is not a big deal. Uh, it's quite, quite fast to do. And this is the, the whole stack to use it. Uh, from starting bottom up, uh, there's the VCU itself, uh, which needs a firmware, uh, which is a binary blob from Xilinx. Um, then you have a kernel driver, uh, you have a user space library, and an implementation layer for OpenMax. Um, all of these three are provided by Xilinx with sources with the same license uh, which is permissive but restricted to Xilinx hardware. Um, okay, and then, well, OpenMax, as far as I know, is implementing APIs to interface to a codec. And so you can use it directly probably, but uh, I think the most common usage is to use this streamer. This streamer is as an OpenMax plugin, so you can just put an OpenMax uh, H264 encoder in your GStreamer pipeline. Um, okay, so to instantiate the VCU, you have to put a block in Vivado, just like the, the ZKMP block, it's not really being synthesized in FPGA, but it represents how it should be connected to the rest of the world. And then you have to set up a device tree entry in Linux, which is standard, nothing special here. Okay, um, and then uh, you have to set up all of the software. Um, the, all of the software is only in the Meta Peta Linux layer, not in the uh, Meta Xilinx BSP layer, which uh, is a layer that you are not supposed to use with the, uh, with the community workflow. Uh, so I, I tried to, u to use this layer just to have the VCU support and I lost uh, a few days in, in, in beating my head. And after all, I understood it was better not to do it. Uh, the, uh, the reason is that, um, well, I'm using Yocto 2.4, which ships GStreamer 1.12, while uh, MetaPeta Linux uh, has BB Appens to change that to GStreamer 1.8. 
but then it, uh, it tries to apply patches that it does not ship, so it, is, it expects them to be in the pocket layer, but they are not there anymore, so it won't build. Uh, but there is a much simpler solution, that is, don't use the Peta Linux layer, just take from the Meta Peta Linux layer these four rules unmodified, which are the kernel module, the firmware, the uh, user space library, and the OpenMax integration. Uh, take them as is, and then take this BB append file from the, the same layer, which is for GStreamer OMX, so it tweaks the OpenMax uh, lay, uh, module of GStreamers to uh, switch to the Xilinx fork, which is different from upstream, and apply some build flags to customize it for Xilinx. Uh, that, and then finally you can install GStreamer 1.0 OMX, OMX and that's it, uh, nothing more, it builds and it works. You can write a pipeline that encodes H265 or H264 and so on. And well, I didn't test it extensively, but at very few tests it works fine. And that's it. So, uh, just to draw some conclusion, as you probably understood, this chip is very powerful and very flexible. Uh, but it's also very complex, and the same thing applies to software. Also, its software support is, is complex to set up, uh, but uh, if you know where to go and find the, the appropriate uh, pieces, uh, you can set it up. Uh, also, uh, Xilinx is uh, providing uh, their support currently mostly uh, out of mainline, but they are working in mainline. Uh, at the moment, I think they're a bit slow in that, probably because they want to set up everything uh, in their own branches first, but uh, they are slowly moving, which is very good. And uh, all they are also uh, putting an effort in using standard tools, um, which is promising for the future also. That's all. Hope that was not boring too much. Any questions? Yes? Uh, I'm sorry, can you speak louder? Okay. Okay, the question is uh, if I consider for ATF loading using the fit image for U-Boot, which is used in other platforms? Uh, the answer is no, I didn't consider it, because this, uh, th this approach is the one that has been implemented by other users of this platform, or by maintainers of this platform, so uh, it was already almost ready to do, uh, but I think uh, FIT could make some improvement. Uh, SPL can road FIT, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I don't. Yeah. What? So, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so yeah, Rockchip is used in the fit image, probably others. Uh, I, I agree with you in, uh, at first sight that this seems a better approach. I don't know if there are reasons it has been done in another way. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I don't know why it hasn't been done that way. Sorry. Any more questions? Yep. Uh, I, with GPU well and support, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm not using it. Sorry.
Yes, that. Yeah, I. Uh, okay, so the thing is, uh, using X11 uh, does actually many copies of buffer if you use Windows, windowing, but uh, in full screen it does not. Okay, right. But, uh, actually, in fact, I used it only in full screen, but it didn't give any improvements uh, in features over the FBDEF, so I stayed with the simpler FBDEF. So X11 for full screen uh, seems like to have like FBDEF to the user, so it's simpler. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much.